it's all about the solutions, and we got to figure out what the solutions are. And it turns out that Y Combinator is a great place to to kind of um, inspire people to think about solutions. Oh. We do all, all day long, and you have to be sort of optimistic, optimistic to do it. Hey, it's the Engineering Podcast. I'm Adam. I'm Brian. And I'm Gustav. Welcome back to the laboratory. That's what we're calling it, right? <laughs> I don't know. We've been, for the last 60 episodes, we've been trying to settle on something to call the space where we meet to talk about this stuff. Laboratory makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm settling in on that one as well. Uh, special thanks, as always, to our backers on Patreon who help uh, keep this thing rolling and uh thanks to our guest this week who you heard in the intro uh gustav alstromer he's a partner at y combinator and we uh reached out to him through uh one of our old guests on the podcast leah culver so thank you to you leah for putting us in touch brian you want to hit what we're what we're going to talk about yeah this is this is uh one of the episodes in our series into climate change and so gustav i'd love to hear what uh what you're up to over at y combinator sure but yeah first uh maybe let's talk about just how you ended up at y combinator as a partner i mean that means well so maybe even further back what do you do as a partner there, right? Uh, Review sure. a lot of applications. <laughs> uh, that's what I've been doing lately, yeah. Um, so my background, uh, I, I grew up in Sweden, and then I ended up in the U.S. Um, a little bit more than 10 years ago. I ended up in, in, in the Bay Area through starting a company. So that's kind of how I initially got in touch with YC. Uh, I spent the last almost five years working at Airbnb, where I was part of starting and running the growth team. Um, and basically growth is math, uh, to some extent where you're basically just like finding scientific ways of, of growing a product and in everybody's case, a really awesome product that people already loved. Um, I joined YC part-time, uh, a little bit more than a year ago, then full-time last summer. Um, and working at YC as a partner, I th- almost think of myself as a teacher. Uh, I feel like sometimes the people in the, in the class, uh, in the batch, uh, think of us that way. We during the batches, and I've done two full time now batches. Uh, we work with twenty five, more than twenty five companies per group, and then there's two partners per group, and then often you get matched with companies that you have a specific skill set. So my background is in consumer internet growth. Those are the kind of companies that I'm good at helping. But many many of the kind of um, things that you work with the companies on are just kind of generic things to early stage startups. So people have problems with fundraising. People have problems with growth. People have issues trying to figure out if people want their product. Like they're, those challenges aren't different for everyone. So that's kind of like a little bit about what I'm doing at, at, at YC. And, and then more broadly, Y Combinator is uh, like incubator, accelerator. Like what are they, you know, what are you calling it these days in terms I of... just call it Y Combinator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Y Combinator, totally. y Combinator is a, is a, is a, has been around since 2005. Um, it was started by Paul Graham and Jessica Livingstone together with two of their friends, Trevor and Robert. They started by uh, investing in less than 10 companies the first summer. They called it the summer program. And uh, those people were just supposed to come and work on their startups for the summer. And then uh, they got a little bit of money from Paul and, from Paul and Jessica. And some of those companies um, turned out to be, one of them was turned out to be Reddit. <laughs> um, uh, another one of those companies uh, was Looped, that Sam worked on. Another one was um, uh, Kiko, that Justin and Emmett, that later started Twitch, um, was founder of. So that early group kind of like set the stage of what YC ended up becoming later. And it was far more than a summer program. And uh, Paul and Jessica call it the batch, and we've now done 26 batches of startups, and they do tw- twice a year, and they've obviously grown a lot from the first, like I forgot how many companies, but say seven or eight companies in the very first batch. The way it works is that you can apply to YC at any stage, whether you just got started, whether you basically aren't really getting started, just have something you want to work on, to you've been working on something for like a year or two, and you maybe even raise some other some other funding. and. What YC really do well, I think, is, is help you focus on the right things. 
the heart the hard thing about starting a startup is none of us has ever done it before when we started. Mm-hmm. Very few people have done a startup before they started a startup. So it's very hard to have experience. Um, and it goes for all of us. Um, and the benefit of starting a company together with a bunch of other people is, is that you learn from them at the same time. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's whenever you do something for the first time that is risky, it's, it's better to not be alone. And, and YC, by doing this as part of a batch, just helps with all of that. And I was so happy I was in India last year and I met a bunch of founders that we funded and two of them met in YC three years ago and now they're best friends and their companies are kind of the same same stage, uh, which means they've gone to like over 100 employees each and they're still kind of learning from each other every single week. They meet up every week um, to learn about what are the challenges when you go to 100 employees. Um, And I, 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 I think that's a really, really uh, kind of good example of like what it, why it's so good to have other people start companies with you when you do it. And I think you can't, the sort of crude point, I think, to make about Y Combinator as an institution in terms of launching companies that then go on to thrive and make money, it's really good at it. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of companies have come out of this architecture that I, it's always struck, uh, Brian and I talk about it all the time. It's always struck us that it's very, it's, it's, it's sort of a teaching uh, learning perspective, even insofar as like few published things like ongoing that I read up on and I go, yep, that's a really good explanation of blockchain. I'm going <laughs> to share that with everyone. And it's public and it's part of it, like, because a rising tide in that space lifts all boats, right? And that's, it's a very, which is almost anti-competitive in a world that is otherwise very competitive. And I don't, you know, it's like, it's a nice perspective to think, here's a person I can talk to about what I'm working on that's not going to steal the idea from me yeah. and run away, which I think is what capitalism tends to promote. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's true. And then like, there's certainly something to having a huge alumni network of um, of other companies. So everything from the say, I'm let's say I'm a startup who sells to other startups, then joining YC, there's 1,500 startups to sell to. Um, so, and many of those founders are willing to take a risk on you, just like other founders were willing to take a risk on them. So, so there are many other benefits why, why having a lar- large kind of, uh, community of companies is a good thing. Um, I specifically am working on growth and there are lots of, um, areas where shared knowledge between startups on growth can be valuable. And, um, in my experience there, it's just some of those things, there, there's some areas that, People are incredibly open around, let's say, open source uh, engineering and things like that. But there are other areas where people do not talk to other people around, specifically don't talk publicly around on, on the things they're working because they're so easy to copy, but they're so hard to figure out. But it's easier to do it if you're in a small kind of enclosed group. So in the world of growth, um, somehow it ended up being a lot of dinners. Um, it wasn't a lot of conferences, and the conferences weren't that good. It was more like smaller communities. And that's because many of the things that we worked on um, were hard to figure to figure out in the first place but once you figured out it it was like very very easy and obvious and you kind of want to share that with a little smaller group um they're just like a little bit different take on on things um but that's like not true for engineering and for other things necessarily so is uh y combinator also serves uh some of the same roles as an early very early stage vc right there's there's some investment capital there's a business legal services there's uh, equity being exchanged, right? Is that still part of yeah. Y Combinator? So, so I think one of the goals from the very beginning was to make things simpler and, and easier and cheaper. So when I raised funding back in the days, I think my legal bill was over $50,000 um, just mm-hmm. for a small seed round. The legal team, um, uh, John uh, and Caroline at, at, at YC, they uh, came up with some, something called the SAFE. SAFE is a financial uh, instrument that you can invest kind of like a convertible note, but without the bad stuff in startups at really no cost. So, so you don't really need lawyers anymore to, to raise your first round of funding. Um, you just use the standard document that, that is really good for the founder and, and uh, has like one page of, of terms, and those are very straightforward. And vast, vast, vast majority of YC companies use that, that document to raise funding right now. Um, so that's a good thing that we've, we've kind of added a lot of like, fundraising used to be a place where, where it was kind of asymmetry in knowledge, where some of the investors have done this 100 times and the funders have done it zero times. And they had, obviously, as a result, the investors have a lot more information. We kind of, over the years, have done a lot to, to change that, that, that kind of dynamic. Um, 
YC uh, invests $120,000 for 7%, and that's been the same for now for probably five or six years. It used to be less money. Um, and then after, after YC, we have something called Demo Day, where companies go up and present to many, many hundreds of investors, uh, sometimes over 1,000, and continue to raise funding from there. Fantastic. That uh, I remember we were... I f- I started a business in 2009 was my first startup. I guess that that probably wasn't right when YC was founded, but I feel like that was kind of right around the same time I was starting to hear about YC. And uh, I mean, that that early process, one of my co-founders had just graduated from law school. So we were kind of like, well, we'll take all this stuff on ourselves. I just finished business school. And we're like, we'll do all our finances. We'll do all our legal work. And it worked out okay. Things were okay in the end, but <laughs> they certainly weren't done uh, totally correct. <laughs> <laughs> there were certainly some hiccups. Um, Absolutely. To uh, <laughs> to have the, all of a sudden, we started seeing this wave coming from uh, companies like Y Combinator and investors who were like, "Hey, I'm tired of seeing my companies lose twenty five percent of what they just raised in bills. So here are some documents to use." And it was it was mind blowing to all of a sudden see uh, people who. Up until then, I think the whole VC industry, a lot of people looked at it as sort of predatorial. Like, we have money and we'll help you, but we're really here to help ourselves. And and that has shifted a lot. And at least for me personally, I when I think of sort of uh, benevolent investment groups, uh, benevolent incubator, it wasn't even really a thing at, at the time. And uh, Y Combinator is always top of mind. It just seems like such a great group. And uh, Paul Graham's public image, I, I don't know what he's like when you know him personally, but love his essays, uh, always just seems like a, a friendly, outspoken guy that really wants to help people do cool, innovative stuff. Um, yeah, that's, that's a pretty, pretty good, uh, pretty good, good uh, summary, I think. Um, yeah, two, two, went, 2009 was the year that Airbnb went through YC. Uh, they, they went through, I think 2000, many of the companies that we now think of like the really successful ones, it takes years to become really successful. So yeah. Airbnb started to, like 10 years ago now. Um, and, um, went through YC in the winter of 2009 and then, um, Dropbox was actually earlier than that. Um, so, so, and then Stripe, I think was like maybe a year after 2010. You guys have so many, so many great companies in the portfolio. I, uh, I've been watching YC pretty closely. I went to college with Alexis Ohanian. Oh, that's really cool. So we've been watching from, I've been watching from the beginning, like, Hey, that guy, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like we, had, we weren't buddies, but I had classes with him and stuff. Right, right, yeah. Um, so we reached out through Leah because we saw. It. So I guess the piece to talk about in this process is you guys publish a request for startups. There's a process where you have a list of things. You're like, hey, if you got a project in this space, send in an application. Um, and we saw one that synced up with our ongoing series of. I think by the time this airs, we'll have done like a basic intro and then one where we talk about the chemistry Mm -hmm. uh, of climate change. Um, But we saw a request for what's the, what's the like formal term for that request for application Uh, request request for startup. It's, it's kind of a loose, loose document. RFS. (laughs) We we put them on, uh, put a new one, probably updated uh, at least once a year. Request for startups is both a way to inspire people that previously didn't think that YC would fund them because their idea, idea was kind of what they thought was outside of what YC would fund. Um, and it's also kind of a way for us to say, these are the problems that we think are important to work on. I get the most excited when I, when I see people that never thought they would apply for YC. And now because we put out the request for startup, they're like, oh, of course I should apply to YC. Like this, mm-hmm. Now they, they want what I do. We, the truth is we always like want everything. Like we're, we're, we will read anything and like I think the, some of the best companies are not going to look have a pattern match. It's not going to look like anything you've seen before. It's going to be a new area. It's going to be a new type of solution. Um, so that's why you want things to kind of change quite a bit. Um, request to startups is, is a way for us to kind of both inspire and to um, uh, and to tell the world what we think are important. And so we saw one of those for carbon capture. Yeah. Uh, startups, which uh, the part of what we've been talking about in the context of our climate change uh, conversation on Z- on the on Z engineering is that we just don't. It's and I don't consider I don't consider this to be a pessimistic 
perspective. I think it's just realistic. The simple math of population growth is against any of the things that I feel like are slotted into popular culture right now as the solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. While all those things are necessary, this sheer math doesn't work out without us applying some sort of ingenuity to the problem to solve aspects of it that are that just have to do with like uh, cleaning the up release of carbon <laughs> into the atmosphere in one form or another that has to, you know, like we need, to, we have to science the problem to an extent, I feel like. Yeah. And math the problem. And, uh, yeah, Adam's Adam, made, like, Adam made a good comment on our first uh, kind of intro episode to climate change where he just compared uh, CO2 and carbon, carbon emissions in general to uh, your, your garbage, right? There were, there were times when we just let garbage pile up in places, old civilizations, old towns, small towns, new places. Uh, but now we just we just have uh, municipal like services that come and pick it up. Of London you used to, to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we just can't do it anymore, and and this is now it's time. Now it's time to put municipal services in place and to put businesses in that cities contract with, and we'll clean this stuff up. And so from that perspective, it starts to feel like something. Oh, we already do stuff like that. Let's just do it again. So yeah, what makes climate change difficult is two things I think is one is that it's the biggest problem we've probably faced as humanity. Uh, it's, it's that, that big. And the second part is that it, it, it's not something that one country can solve by for themselves. It's that something that every single country have to solve together. And those things are not like we have had things like um, the ozone layer and things like that in the past that, that have actually been similar in the characteristics that we have solved to some extent. Um, but yeah, it's, it's quite different than, than the, Say manure and though you have in the streets of New York, <laughs> New York when you have lots of horses. That was solvable, but this is a little bit different. Yeah, this is it's it's the note I wrote down was moonshot in the sense of like these these problems. The only thing that I can think of that required this level of, you know, cooperation and or sort of competition, because we're talking about a different political scenario, mm -hmm. but like the race to the moon was this level of like, well, we got to get like literally every smart person in the country and put them in a room <laughs> and say, solve these problems. We have 10 years. Yeah. War, um, cold war, <laughs> war motivation, right? It right. And it's so take it to a aggressive place right away, but we need, we need a lot of, a lot of investment. Uh, yeah. It's, it's very easy to be pe pessimistic. I think it's, uh, but, but, that there's there's no you, you never you can't really go to the moon if you're pessimistic about going to the moon um so so i think that if you talk about before we get into like karma removal and all these technologies but if you talk about the psychology of, of climate change um and I, i've spent some time thinking about this and i've tried to read up as much as i can about this but it's such a huge problem that we kind of get blocked in what what should we do and some people they just kind of say oh we shouldn't i shouldn't worry about this because someone else will solve it for me some people will start blaming their friends and be like, oh, you shouldn't be doing this and that. You should be stop driving your car and you shouldn't be fly flying on vacation so far. Um, and I think none of those things are that useful. Um, like, like judging each other for a kind of a problem that appeals, applies to all of us isn't, isn't really that useful. And, and the solution to it is not – and I've tried to look historically on this. I can't think of a specific solution where we just solve it by people being more moral like that, that or being more – more ethical like there's very few of them and uh, we can touch on clean meat afterwards but there's another example there's been vegetarians for hundreds and hundreds of years trying to convince people that eat meat to eat not eat meat and that had just never worked <laughs> uh, so so there are many examples where like if you believe in something and just by convincing everyone else then that will just you change it so i think climate change is, is the same way where like it doesn't really matter well it does matter but it doesn't matter it's not going to solve it by just trying to convince each other that we should just do um, things that have less impact on climate, mm -hmm. it's going to have to be um, political and technology uh, solutions to it. And and I'm very excited about technology solutions. The political solution is going to take some time, and it's happening to some degree in different countries um, in, in a good way. But technology aspect of it, I think, is the, the most exciting. And like we've seen electrification of society, like kind of just like come super fast in the last couple of years. And like like we didn't even you start noticing it when when you see electric cars, and now you just that was just a couple of years ago. And now you see them all over. And now you're getting used to electric scooters and electric bikes and like it's and why can invested in an electric airplane company a year ago. So like it's coming pretty much everywhere. Big changes like that takes a long time, but that's a technological solutions to, to climate change. Um, so love to talk more about like the, the carbon removal stuff of it, but I, I think it's very obvious to see that technology plays the 
one of the absolute most important roles in changing this. Well, it's a it's a risk reward is not the answer. I mean, to an extent, it's risk, but it's more like for the output that we, for the effort that we can put into it. What's the percentage reward we're chasing? And reduction just doesn't get us far enough. To it's necessary for sustainability. But you have to start having solutions that can scale with the fact that it's just like, we're going to have another billion people eventually. And then another billion on top of that. So what do we do with yeah. it? <laughs> so um, so if, if, if you think about it, so, so this, if you think about the math, so there's about 30. Growth is math. I love it. There's about <laughs> right? 30 gigaton of, of CO2 that are being emitted each year in the world. And uh, we kind of just saw that stabilized for the last couple of years. Uh, maybe not the very last year, but the previous years it was stabilizing. The only year it really gone down in the last 10 years was uh, 2008 as a result of the financial crisis. Um, but it's, it's stabilized. Um, but that's the emission growth has been stabilizing. The, the, we're still emitting an enormous amount of, 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 of CO2. And um, every single model that, that the IPCC and the, the kind of the, the Paris uh, climate meetings came out with all suggest that we have to not only stop emitting and go down to zero emissions, but we also have to remove uh, carbon from the atmosphere. If we don't remove and just stop emitting, and we kind of like do it um, uh, according to the Paris Agreement, we'll hit one and a half degrees uh, uh, he, uh, warming of the earth. And that's a significant amount. And, and m- most people don't believe that we'll, we'll hit that. We'll hit more like two degrees Celsius. Mm-hmm. Um, and those have two degrees Celsius warming of the earth have very serious consequences for 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 a lot of people. Now, one of the problems with, with, with that potentially is that it's a, the goal is set on the heating. It's, 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 a, it's a degrees of heating. That's the goal. It's not the, it's not the particles per mil. Like there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a way to measure carbon in the atmosphere. Maybe it would be better if you just measure the carbon in the atmosphere as a metric um, for, for uh, how we're doing towards our goal to fix climate change versus just saying, oh, the, worm, the world can't get any warmer. Now, mm-hmm. The good thing about about that is that it gets way easier to count. The hard thing is it gets harder for most people to understand um, that, that particles uh, in the atmosphere is like that's kind of a loose loose things. Um, but that would make it easier to under, to, to just understand uh, well, um, kind of the math. Now there are many things that are sucking up carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, there is there's trees, there's oceans, like those things are already doing it. But there the way that um, the amount that we have to do it. Um, kind of comes back kind of the, the going to the moon. It has to be such an enormous amount that, that the, let's say you wanted to plant more trees in the world. The, the amount of trees that you have to plant and just going through like that kind of playing in your head and be like, if we have to cover like most of US and Canada with trees uh, again, then the amount of kind of administrative effort to do that isn't straightforward. Is that, it sounds easy like, oh, we just planted a lot of trees, but it's not actually that, that straightforward at all. Because we all have, like, they're different. You have to, like, basically convince everyone who owns that land to do that to begin with. Right. Yeah, someone owns the land. Someone has to dig a hole. A... Somebody's got to put something in the hole. Yeah, there's <laughs> an interesting... It's non, non-trivial to plant a tree. <laughs> yeah. There's an interesting component to uh, climate change and, and addressing, uh, addressing the problem where you have to recognize that uh, our... All of modern technology, uh, in a way, is the problem. And it gets really negative really fast if people spin it as, well, we have to stop doing all this stuff. Because then you have to look at all this amazing stuff that we've created as a civilization and and wonderful lives for a lot of people that we've created and opportunity. And you have to say, wait, you want me to stop doing all that stuff? And just reasonably, we know we're not going to stop doing it. So you might curtail some of it you might cut out some of the worst of it you might moderate a lot of it but ultimately like this goes back to our podcast a little bit why we're doing climate change like this stuff is amazing right modern science is is wonderful and beautiful and it's it's kind of like religion for a lot of people Uh, it is it is partly for me right it's it's spiritual and to address climate change you have to look at well how do we keep that stuff how do we move how do we build on top of that uh, and that's like you were saying, Gustav, the the excitement around the technology and the opportunities is I dig more into what's going on and the scale of what's going on and um, how everything fits together. It's everything. And so at looking at it from like a business opportunity and a scientific opportunity, engineering, 
Like you can literally look anywhere on earth right now and say, hey, here's an opportunity to affect our climate in a positive way. Shift this business model this way, shift this practice, change this technology. And I, I went through like a year ago, Adam can attest to this, like a nervousness. I started listening to a podcast called The Elephant. Mm -hmm. Really fantastic podcast about climate change. Uh, I think it was like 22 or 23 episodes, all kinds of different people they interviewed, world leaders, astronauts, scientists. Uh, and I, I was overwhelmed. I was like, man, I'm starting to feel really bad about this and I don't know what to do. And I've, I've gone over that hill or come out of that slump, I guess, a little bit. And now all of a sudden, my eyes are opening. I'm like, wow, I can actually do all kinds of things here to make a difference. Uh, and so from like a business entrepreneurial engineering perspective, it's, it's just a wide open space. And I don't mean that excitement to diminish the difficulty of the task at hand. Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, this is, <laughs> this is potentially the, this is the opportunity for the world to come together to cooperate and accomplish something that will save us, <laughs> save humanity, right? It's, it's the ultimate science fiction story. Uh, you mentioned you just invested in an electric airplane company. Yeah. The idea of not even just how that's attacking the problem, which it is, but it's more just the idea that I could come to you with an application <laughs> for an airplane company <laughs> and maybe get it off the ground, which is not is anyone doing that? Pun. Does anyone else build airplanes? Who, what's your competition look like? <laughs> uh, right. There's. Uh, let's talk about that. There, there's. Uh, there's two. I would say in that space, there's two type of companies that are working on 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 electrical. Um, Aero transportation. Uh, there is all the vertical takeoff companies. So there's like mm -hmm. probably you heard of Kitty Hawk or or, or Lilium or, or those ones. They are pretty far along, and they even have done manned flights, I think. Um, and what they're doing is basically a vertical and takeoff landing, small small kind of um, uh, call them planes, but they're maybe if can fit like a four or ten people or some not some of that. Uh, now most of the flights that we do today aren't that small um and it would be kind of crazy if you had or maybe not crazy but maybe it'd be crazy to have hundreds of them fly from from san francisco to 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 seattle every day like maybe it's better to have larger planes so the other group of companies are working on on slightly larger planes and um the big problem for for electric airplanes is battery density and battery density is coming down pretty fast and a lot, almost everyone that i've heard that are working on this stuff are making some some very serious calculations around when will the battery density of lithium-ion battery get to the point where the, you can fly from here to Seattle in a larger plane. The other big problem with electrical airplanes is, is FAA certification, is that if you make a new airplane, you have to go through a lot of certification so it doesn't fall on, 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 our, on our heads. And that costs a lot of money. Like It's like, best case scenario, $100 million to certify a new, new, new airplane. Wow. Um, so that's the two challenges that those are facing. On the, um, I think they're both kind of compatible. And what YC have actually invested in both of those groups of companies. Um, I think we'll see a lot more vertical takeoff, uh, small kind of uh, airplanes coming going forward. They're just way more efficient. Um, some of the challenges are just like noise. Um, if we're going to have each one of us can have one of those, it's going to be pretty noisy. So you have to find a way to make them quieter. Um, right, drones are pretty pretty. Even the small drones are noticeably <laughs> like yeah, but, but, they're terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to get to the point of say like flying in electrical airplanes across the Atlantic or the Pacific, that's a much bigger challenge, and that's going to take a lot, a lot longer time mm -hmm. um, to get there. Maybe if we ever get there, um, biofuel might be an opportunity. But either way, our emissions through uh, airplanes is is probably the, the three of us are our biggest contributor. I don't know if you got how much you guys are flying, but you don't need that many fl uh, flights per year to make that the number one contributor. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how much you have to burn just to make it happen. Yeah. You know, it, like it's, it's, a, it's, we, we talked, we talk about it in mechanical terms all the time, but like the idea of just, it's a physics problem, right? Like there's efficiency trade-offs as you scale up or down a problem. And at this point we're pretty close to maybe the best way to do getting 200 people across an ocean mm -hmm. in eight yep. hours. Um, I like I'll, to remind people that planes are kind of basically just rocket ships that just don't go all the way to space. <laughs> <laughs> And when you're up there, look right. out and recognize that you're kind of flying around in outer space. And so then picture that when you're thinking about your plane flight. It's not the same as your car. Yeah. Um, so, so going back to, to, to carbon removal stuff a little bit, like um, the reason we, we put out this, this, this request for startups. So this is a – we put out – I'll talk about it in a second. We put out another one at the same time called Clean Meat and Cellular Agriculture, uh, which is around uh, growing meat uh, or, or animal protein in labs. 
Um, the, both of them are kind of in some way moonshots. The, the clean meat ones is easier to understand because there's a large market for people that are eating meat right now. Like there's most people in the world are doing that, so we're willing to pay for that. And if you can make meat that we've made not from animals but in labs um, at a cheaper price or even tastes better, then there will be billions of people that will buy that. So that's a clear kind of market opportunity. And that population, it seems pretty clearly signaling that they don't intend to give up meat. Right. right, right. So, 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 so you have to make, <clears throat> make meat in a different way that's, that's better for the animals and better for the climate. And those are already po- – like this is a very – it's a very reasonable thing if you look at all the science behind this that this will happen. It's just a question of getting to this, the scale and the cost down. Um, and whomever gets that first will probably be a very successful company. Um, on the carbon removal stuff, it's a more complicated because um, there is no private market right now for paying for carbon, really. Like, like the, there's, there's a car, voluntary carbon credit markets. Um, there are governments who have, um, to some extent, have. Uh, uh, carbon tax, but there are not that many kind of carbon bonus for storing. Like most companies don't have a carbon, um, you get paid paid money to store carbon on the ground or store carbon in some way. So the complicated thing with carbon is that it's, it's it requires governments. And the other problematic thing with carbon is that it's not super straightforward right now how um, certification and validation of removing car- carbon would work. <clears throat> so there's a really cool company um, up in, um, in Seattle called Nori. Uh, that are working on this, and there's been companies before as well, and they also put out a really awesome podcast that I want to um, want to suggest here. This is called "Reversing Climate Change," which is like a pretty ambitious uh, ambitious kind of uh, way of describing it. They are basically like the the way that the people and there are many different kind of components and modules into how how you would remove carbon. Uh, one of it would be just like how do you remove from the air and kind of uh, get it into something else, and there's Different technologies there. The most kind of most common one people talk about is direct air capture. Direct air capture is effectively you have air fluid through a big fan, and uh, and then you have a separation kind of process where you separate it, and then you can do different things with that carbon. Um, there is a really good blog post that I p- uh, put out by someone called Julio Friedman, and the blog post is called um, let me let me find the name of it: offsets, onsets, and insets. Um, now. You could take that carbon and put it underground. Um, you can mineralize it, make it limestone or some of that, and just put it back on the ground, kind of like where the oil came from. Um, that's one way you can do it. You could use it to make fertilization for 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 um, uh, for agriculture. That's also interesting. At some point, that's going to go back into the atmosphere. Or you can make something like fuel. And there are some companies working on making fuel out of out of carbon. That seems like a really good idea. If, if we can get, make that to work. I don't think anyone really got on that to work yet. But the, they, they're all kind of different in how you use that carbon. And the truth is, and you can the third, fourth thing is you can make carbon products. And there are lots of cool companies that are, that are taking this carbon to do different things with it, carbon fiber or lots of other things that yeah, you can imagine using this carbon for. Carbon is effectively free, <laughs> so you, you don't have to pay for it. Now, the way you think about, any way you think about all those things, there's going to be a large portion that's going to have to be stored and sequestered and not get back into the atmosphere. That just like kind of the, the basis of carbon removal is that huge portion is going to have to get back and not be worth anything to anyone in the sense that people aren't going to pay for it. So you have to have some amount of government involvement or voluntary involvement from, from companies to be able to make that happen. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the challenging part about car- carbon removal is that you have to, it's, it's, worth, it's still worth something to all of us um, but it's not worth that much to each individual one of us. Um, and and that is the hard part about this, I think. It's like, how do you get the incentives going here? Now, if you talk about technology, so I'm, I'm talking a lot here, but if you talk about the t- t- technology about how, how to do this, it's a cost thing right now. So direct air, air capture and the, and the separation and mineralization of the carbon, um, the main input here is energy. And the thing that did change um, and this is when I, when I talk about this as someone I don't know everything in detail, but talking about it from an optimistic point of view of, uh, of people who want to start companies, um, hopefully we are where we, solar panels were 20 years ago, where people will kind of laugh at them and say, wow, this is really funny. It works, but this will never compete with every other source of energy. But that's changed in the last 20 years. And solar panels now competes with every other source of energy. It actually beats pretty much every other source of energy at new installation. Um, and that is just a function of 
massive amount of scale, massive amount of reduction in cost. And some governments, China and Germany, was pretty good at producing them or, or, or subsidizing them. But now we got into a point where solar is just like by far the cheapest. And, and it turns out that because energy is the most important input in carbon removal, this might be a really good time because the cost of solar has gone down. Things could have, this could be a really good moment for, for, for kind of figuring all this stuff out. And the cost, there's a couple of companies, there's a company in, in Switzerland called Climeworks. They're probably the furthest along. Um, they are basically removing carbon through a direct air capture. They're selling it to the current carbon market, which means they'll probably go back to the atmosphere at some point. Carbon market basically means carbonated water or, or um, selling it to, in their case, a greenhouse uh, where carbon is good for fertility. The cost that they are kind of quoting in per per ton that they're removing is high. I, I don't know the exact numbers. I think I think it's like six or seven hundred dollars per ton. We need to get down to a factor of ten um, to make this truly kind of competitive. Um, but that's kind of like if you the challenge for all these companies is to think think about this factor of ten. Like how can you get the cost down to make this work? Like what are all the things that you can optimize and change to make this work to get down? cost by a factor of 10. And if you could be able to, be able to do that, you now potentially have a really interesting business because carbon removal it might be cheaper than quickly, say, change the airplanes from, from, from running on fuel to electrical. That's going to happen at some point. Um, it's going to be potentially more expensive per ton. I don't know. Well, and it strikes me that uh, what's interesting about it is it's, it's one of the things that comes up when we talk about climate change a lot on the podcast is the idea of this sort of closed system and this cyclical yeah. piece. So like the whole... The whole thing is a cycle, and we're now starting to explore different places where we can plug in more effective or efficient models. And so you're talking about bringing the price of capturing that carbon down, both by increasing the incentive to buy it, but also, you know, with technology, making it cheaper to get the carbon. And it just starts to get like I, the whole time I kept thinking of the, the scene in Back to the Future 2 where he or at the very end of one. But throughout too, where he comes back and he has to throw a bunch of trash in the midst of fusion, you know, like a banana peel and half a beer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the idea is, if you can scale this down, like stuff gets real weird. If the, if I could put a device in my backyard, but the idea, but it's starting to happen with solar power, where people are putting up solar panels and they're kicking power back into the grid. Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah, for sure. There, but that, 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 there's, there's no a clear financial incentive there, and there's a clear. There's right. a clear structure for how that works and how you get paid. Uh, you had to have some some agreements to figure out uh, the net metering agreements to how to get paid for putting solar back on the grid. Uh, we don't really have that as easily understood in in carbon removal. We basically don't have it. Um, but if it, but we know it's doable because plants do it in your backyard all day. Exactly, it's, it's totally doable. <laughs> uh, it's chemically doable. And here here's the the, the interesting thing is like they're like lots of countries in the world and each country can kind of figure out this by themselves. We don't have to figure this carbon market out as a, as the entire world at the same time. Like the climate agreement in Paris is pretty awesome. It's a, it's kind of a binding agreement for each country, but you can, you can go, uh, you can go beyond that for sure. Uh, like the Paris accord gets us to a point, right? But the agreement is every country is going to work on it in the way that they can, right? So there, so it doesn't mean the US has to tackle all of these like 10 things we just laid out in this podcast, right? Every startup doesn't have to solve well, all 10. One country I think can definitely create a, a, car, a market for carbon credits. Uh, the US actually is surprisingly one of the few ones that put out, uh, put out um, some news around that earlier this year. Um, but yeah, each country create their own market here. And there's, if you look on some of the countries been the most proactive is like Iceland and Norway, uh, they um, ha like some of the countries basically have goals of being carbon neutral by X date, and this turns out to be a pretty good way to be carbon neutral um, uh, because there's always going to be some carbon that we are emitting. Like some things, like making steel, uh, uh, is just like we don't we haven't really figured out how to make that without emitting carbon. Like it's just like not straightforward at all. So so for for some countries, if you're truly going to be carbon neutral and be and, and be true to that, you have to come up with some way of, of, of removing carbon. We didn't talk about all the other ways of removing carbon, like like uh, like uh, uh, planting trees or, or, or biochar or um, a bunch of other things. I, I personally, but I could be wrong, I'm personally more interested in the technological, technological ways of doing this, um, mainly because I have experienced technology being very easy to scale. Um, mm -hmm. 
Um, but I, I could be wrong about this. Like who? Like I, I think it would be probably be when we're this early in stage to bet on one technology just because you find it more exciting uh, or your experience is better. I think you have to be very wide. And we're in, in NYC, when we look at these applications for carbon removal, we've been looking very widely at all, all type of solutions, not just the sure. technological solutions. So are as you've been, because you mentioned earlier, you're, you're currently reviewing hundreds of applications. Yeah. Uh, I assume they're not all in specifically this space for Y Combinator right now, but a bunch are. And I'm curious from from like an investment standpoint, and I know YC, I'm sure your mandate is not to be 100% based on profit, uh, just based on the things that you guys do. But what do you what are you evaluating right now as the business opportunity? Because I feel like you have to allow some leeway in this space, right? And say, well, maybe a market will emerge, or maybe you're helping to create a market that's happening, or maybe something will just come along. And this technology seems promising, and hopefully it will be lucrative in five years when it's developed. Like, What's your mindset? What are you seeing there? So from a high level, the way, the way I think about it, and I, I'm not sure if I'm speaking for, for all of YC here, but the way I, I think about it is that this is a problem that we don't really have any choice but to solve. Like, so, so it's very clear that we have to solve this problem. Um, now the question comes down to how do we solve it and, and, and how uh, are there like a role for commercial players there? I think that if you create a good enough market um, that is, is kind of certified and validated that like, like in terms of how you are removing carbon, that's not an easy, easy, easy um, solution, but like if you certify and validate how you remove carbon from the atmosphere, um, then you can have different companies playing in that market trying to do that more efficiently. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of like a good place to start. The question is more, where does the, the, the kind of the money come into that market? And that's the thing that I've been thinking a lot about is in the beginning, and this is very encouraging when we put out the, the RFS, is we had lots and lots of people with lots of resources emailing and want to help out. Uh, and I know there are companies like Google and, and others that are already carbon neutral. Like they are like not emitting any carbon in their operations. So there might be a lot of other companies that were willing to support this um, voluntarily to begin with because they know that this would be a way, way forward. Um, but on the other end, you have countries, of course. So countries can, can, can have carbon credits to remove carbon. And that carbon credit um, ideally should go into the most efficient market, if that makes sense. So let's say the, if you have a market for carbon tax, then it will basically tax the worst emitters of carbon. If you have a market for carbon credit, you are paying to the most efficient uh, kind of uh, organization that are remov removing carbon from the atmosphere. So hopefully we can at some point get to a stage where all those things exist. There's like a, a safe way of actually measuring this and there's a bunch of incentives coming from governments and co corporations. At that point, I think we have a market. And, and then at that point, the companies can can... There's different companies in different stages here and different models. Like I don't think you have one company that's going to do an end-to-end -end solution doing everything uh, and then win. That's typically not how markets evolve. So you have specialization. And, but when you have this, you're going to probably see um, lots of innovation uh, and lots of more uh, people getting into this space. And that's not something, um, if I look historically, I've, I'm seeing that right now, but if I look historically, it hasn't been a lot of people of the people that typically start startups in, in, um, in the Bay Area that have gotten into this at all. But that might be changing right now. And, and our goal was to, with, with this was to, to, to continue to do that. I want to plug two more websites in this. Uh, one of them is called air, airminers.org. Uh, there's a couple guys that basically um, made an effort to put all the companies that have experience in this space uh, on, one, on one side. Cool. Uh, oh, great. And they basically have all of the companies that work on this in the entire world. So it's, it's not that many. It's like a, maybe 100, less than 100. No, it's like 50. And those are all the ones that they've come across that work on this. <laughs> so that's all the companies wow. that exist right now in the whole world that work on this stuff in some way or another. Uh, and there's another organization called uh, Center for Carbon Removal, uh, which is really awesome. They're, they're in Berkeley. And they are mm -hmm. putting out the research. They're kind of a policy um, uh, they, they work a lot on, on policy. They're putting out a lot of research on, on for companies that want to get started on how to think about this from a uh, both technological but also from a policy policy angle. So those are two really good resources for people that want to get into this. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my, my view of, kind of where we are today. Um, if all this stuff works out, then it's very clear that this can be like one of the most profitable and biggest companies in the world because we we have a very large, large problem in front of us. If you think of like the 30 plus gigaton 
of carbon we emit. And even if you get paid 50 bucks or 100 bucks per ton, I'll say 50 bucks, that's an, it can't even speak to how big of the market that would, that would be. <laughs> like it doesn't compare to most of the things we've seen so far. So I think, that, I think the problem is when you talk about it, it or not when, not when you talk about it, when, when yeah. one talks about it, when you hear about it in the media, right? Whatever. Like it, it has this tone of, it's that pessimism part, right? Like the tone is very like, we have to do this or the planet's going to die. That's, that's a disservice to the extent to which the problem is so huge that it's also this wild opportunity to work on this thing that already exists at a scale that we just haven't even been able to consider with problems before, right? Like that's the size of the problem. There's so much solvable yeah, people, for money. Like I, like I mentioned in, in the beginning, there's like two, two phases that we go through. You must go through two phases. One is like the denial phase where we're like, this is really bad and I don't know what to do about it. Uh, and the second phase is the judgment phase. I think where people are just like judging each other for like, oh, if you just take more personal responsibility, then 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 everything gets solved. Like I mentioned in the beginning, I think you have to get past both of those phases, and then you have to get to a phase of like true solution phase, where like all you do is thinking about how to solve this at scale, uh, and and solving it at scale is a different thing because there are many things that are being kind of promoted as like good for CO two. Uh, removal, um, but they might not actually matter at all in the grand scheme of things. Like, like mm-hmm. making your, the, the, say, the washing powder you, you buy, or like some, something like that, like the CO two neutral, is like it just doesn't really matter. Like there are <laughs> like ten or fifteen or twenty large em- sources of, of emissions. We just have to fix those, and then and the other stuff kind of like we can figure that out later. Um, so we have to think of this at scale and think of this as math, um, and we're not really doing that it's just similar to other problems that humans are talking about like we really have trouble with statistics and trouble with like thinking of like like what is impactful and what, what is a big deal it's like we talk about um um how dangerous self like autonomous vehicles are but then we don't talk about how dangerous it is to be in a human driven vehicle they are way, like very dangerous uh, <laughs> yeah we're generally really bad yeah, at we statistics just can't, i mean can't like think humans of it that general way. your average person is it's a weird way to conceptualize stuff because it's a, a, a level of relativity that you don't apply in I your think, daily uh, life. Carbon, carbon emissions and climate change and the environment, recycling, all this stuff. I, I feel like as, as we've been talking about it on the podcast and, and I've just been digging in, I've realized how big, I think how big of like a, a branding <laughs> issue there is. Like the whole situation has been rebranded over and over and over again, right? When we were kids, there was... Uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. Acid rain. Acid acid rain. Acid rain. And it was global warming. And then you have people <laughs> throwing snowballs inside the Senate. And you're like, what the hell is going on? And I, what I've really, what I've come to really appreciate when, when you, when you dive into this stuff and realize the scope of it, you also start to realize that most people just haven't considered what is actually happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, and part of it is because a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, pollution coming from this, a lot of the problem coming from this is in manufacturing and industrial processes and stuff that generally as a society we're <clears throat> generally as a society we're removed from. And it was it was interesting. My my old startup was in the manufacturing space. So I worked as a manufacturing engineer for a while and my startup was about data capture on manufacturing companies. So I spent all this time uh, doing something I really love, which is learning about all the technologies manufacturing companies all over the world are working on. And when you start to see the absurdity of scale with very specific things, like there are huge global companies that just make like wax sprays to go on crops to help them do particular things to help fix chemicals to them. And you're like, what is what a strange thing that we do? We're doing it all over the planet. It's this wild chemical process, this complexity, expense, uh, and and this it's a scope problem. It's a lack of just exposure to things, right? No one, most people have never been in a manufacturing plant. They just get stuff from Target, uh, which is fine. That's part of the excitement of like modern technology, modern life. But it, without ex- starting to expose people a little more to some of this stuff, it's really hard to get your head around what is happening and to have like a, to have any perspective on, well, what can I do and what is my place in this? And and potentially to vote appropriately, right? To vote for the right policies and the right people, sure. Uh, we need some serious shifts in how information's getting out, um, and I hope I hope people who are doing this now don't take offense to like that that perspective. But uh, we need some po- we need some of this positivity, and that was particularly what we were so excited about when we saw Y Combinator 
uh, ask for these. I once, I once talked to a dude at, I think, one of your barbecues, Brian, like five or six years ago, who had just finished doing like a risk analysis as a consultant on behalf of McDonald's because they wanted to offer a breakfast nationwide. They wanted to offer a breakfast sandwich that can, that, that included one slice of avocado. <laughs> and he was like, and I had to return to them a report that said that their use of that much avocado would drive the price of avocados up so much that they couldn't, <laughs> That they that they couldn't make money off of that sandwich. <laughs> They've ruined the avocado market because they're so big. Really, I thought that was a really interesting perspective in this idea of scale, right? Like there are weird decisions you got to think about at that scale where people are running, you know, analysis on here's how much of avocado is available in the world in within reasonable shipping distance of our facilities. Well, that's the crazy thing with, uh, and this must be really interesting for you too, Gustav, as you're thinking through what these opportunities are and the businesses you're looking at. Cause I kind of, I make the joke to people sometimes and I sort of mean it seriously about like wind power, for instance, if we build too many windmills, we break other things, right? You break that is kind of jokey because I'm not sure mathematically that one actually happens. But dams are a great example, right? Dams cause huge problems. Yeah. Uh, it's clean energy, but you're transferring the problem somewhere else. And when you get to like the underlying physical principles of you don't get anything for free in the universe, uh, you start to realize that. And it's it's an interesting... This is sort of like a meta analysis of everything that we're talking about right now. But what happens down the road when all of these companies are successful? When we start making bricks made of carbon or carbon nanotubes are all over the place and everything, is that going to cause what's the next thing? And and to have I feel like we're I feel like we're a fairly enlightened community these days. Yeah. Uh colloquially about the whole planet. Uh and that's sort of the next step. We got to pay really close attention to this stuff as we do it. And I think part of the interesting aspect is, is like you were saying, there's not one solution. It's not just stop doing this thing and replace it with this. We've got to like really spread stuff out. We've got to totally rethink how everything operates. Yeah, um, I, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. I was thinking about when you when you uh, so that on that on that on that topic, like like I, I am personally super just like fascinated by by geoengineering in general. Like I'm just like watch all the videos and, and, and read everything I can come, come across. Um, we've already geoengineered our world. So we already have like changed by pulling all this carbon from the ground that were like dead dinosaurs and putting them out, out in the atmosphere. We've changed a lot already. We've already done geoengineering. So we know that it can go really bad if we do it wrong. Um, now, I think most of the people that speak about geoengineering are trying to solve problems and think in positive terms. There are some of them that have more unintended consequences than others. And I read something recently that I thought was interesting, which is geoengineering might turn out to be the cheapest way of solving climate change. Now, that has pretty potentially scary consequences because that means individual countries can go and do it. Right? So let's say you're a country that's going to go underwater and be like, well, I'm going to emit a bunch of things in the atmosphere that blocks 0.5% of the sunlight to the atmosphere so that our country doesn't go under, under, underwater. Like that's not a crazy thing to think that that might happen, and it'd be far cheaper for that country to do that than to build an economy that removes all the carbon from the atmosphere. I'm not uh, <laughs> saying that this is what 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 YC have anything to do with, but but there was an earthquake in uh, so there was a there was a, a eruption from a volcano in Philippines uh, like a, a decade ago or so, and that year was a much colder year in the world than 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 any year around that. Because the ash was basically covering the sunlight, and that basically, um, to some extent, stopped climate change or uh, for that year because we'd be able to 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 block some of the sunlight. So, w my point was that there are there might if we don't do this now, there might be other solutions that'll be far riskier and are are cer certainly cheaper for those countries that are going to be in trouble. And and we, we still haven't seen even close to as much damage that climate change can do that we haven't really seen the, like desperation of anyone yet. Like there's some, just, of course, it's been seen like. Um, some communities, but we haven't really seen what we what we expect to see. Uh, when you talk about scale earlier, one of the things that came to mind is that there's a um, love to talk more about this. It's my time, but um, the clean meat industry is is super fascinating, and there's a much clearer understanding of how that will work out. The leading company there is Impossible Foods. Uh, Impossible Foods make um, plant based burgers that bleed like real burgers, and they taste and smell like real burgers. And it was kind of a fun thing. And I, tr I tried the burgers a bunch of times in the last year. 
uh, here, in, here in San Francisco. And, and the whole question is like, when do they get to scale? Like literally less than a week ago, they announced that they're going to White Castle. And they are <laughs> wow. selling a $2 burger uh, in White Castle. And it's, it's basically starting like right now. What is the, what is the, those are just like sliders, yeah, right? Yeah, like little it. mini burgers? Yeah, yeah. At White Castle, oh, I think? Uh, what do they usually cost? I haven't been in a White Castle I don't know. Like I have no years. idea. But, but that's, that's the scale, right? Because like the, most, of, most of the people that eat, most eat burgers don't go. Yeah. Just to meet that production People don't go to a fancy restaurant scale. in San Francisco. That's like not what most people do. Most people go to um, like a fast food, fast food place to eat burgers. And the fact that like we have now one company who's making burgers effectively in labs um, uh, in um, – I don't know if these are made in bioreactors, but like effectively in labs, um, go to something like White, White Castle. They also raised like, I think way over $100 million from, from uh, Singapore and other investors like at the same time. So, so this is someone who's actually going for scale. And this is what we need happening very quickly. They're selling Soylent in Walmart. I just saw that the other day. <laughs> That's another example. Of, I was reminded of that because you mentioned bioreactors, but like one of the things they're working on at Soylent is trying to grow their supplies in things where you just need, it's a vat and, you just need sunlight and algae and water, and it spits out fats yeah, we can but, use but, to feed humans. That are, that are really both of high, these areas you know, are areas where, like, we're in the scale of figuring out how, how to scale and to figure out the infrastructure. We're not in the scale of figuring out whether this works or not. We do know that it works. We just have to figure out to make it cheaper. And like you said before, growth is math. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, you know, like, I feel like a, a place to wrap this up because we're coming up to you know close to time is you. You mentioned a couple websites which. Uh, we will put in the show notes and you should absolutely check out. But I think one of the coolest things in this whole thing is like when we talk about the idea of the moonshot, I, I frequently like to point out that like they did all that get to the moon stuff without, without our level of interconnectivity and digital capacity and all that sort of stuff. The idea that you can just be like, hey, yo, here's a website with literally everyone who's working on this problem. Is a thing that didn't exist when Brian and I were graduating from college, right? Like we just kind of... That's actually what we started our first business to do. I got into manufacturing. I was working as an engineer and I realized how wildly difficult it was as an engineer working on projects to find the technologies I needed. And I wasn't doing anything particularly special, right? I I was doing robotic systems at a manufacturing plant, but just even simple stuff, right? Like you need... Like putting grips on golf putting clubs. Putting grips on golf clubs, right? Me, fairly menial tasks, yeah. but uh, just simple things like finding the right electromagnet for an application. Industry this speaks to the scale again. The scope of types of and different companies that make electromagnets for mm-hmm. manufacturing are are unbelievable. Like there's just nothing in the consumer world that compares, right? There are 10 companies that make TVs. You go to Walmart, you can see them all, you pick one and you leave and they're all basically the same. But once you get into like the infrastructure that supports consumerism, can p- supports our TV screens, it's just it's mind bogglingly complicated. And so that the uh, kind of off on a little bit of a tangent, but uh, yeah, that's what our first company was doing was capturing all that information and trying to make it available. And it's just it's absolutely wild uh, to be in a space and to be in a culture here. I think in California, which I feel like drives a lot of this. Uh, in a really positive way to be in a culture where we're sharing stuff. We kind of kicked off the show talking about Y Combinator making documents, something as simple as making documents available for businesses to make it easier for them to go off the ground. That's a huge barrier to entry for companies. And then putting them onto the same system where literally anyone with an internet access yeah. can go, okay, I'll use that. And <laughs> and now that we're seeing Billions now that we're people. seeing the same thing, you saw this um, this amazing thing happen with software because software, in a way, is kind of free to make. Uh, this release of of information, right? Like Linux competes with Windows, and Mac OS, and Mac is built on Linux on Unix, right? So the same thing is starting to happen with hardware, uh, which is just so interesting for me to see uh, that application. Something that was so proprietary when I was working on it. I mean, you literally don't let people into your manufacturing plant. That is all of your IP. Uh, Forget about that. Yeah, Let's I mean, share. <laughs> so, I mean, so many of the hardware companies that apply to YC are often built on the open source kind of software layer, layer on that hardware. Oh, so, amazing. like, like Raspberry Pi is in like like tons of applications that 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 companies are applying. Or it's it's totally true. It's totally true. And, and hopefully, this relates yeah. to to this 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 topic as well. Well, thanks for 
thanks for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I'm <laughs> thanks for and thanks Thank for coming so to yeah. talk about it. Uh, this is great. I can tell how excited you are. Uh, you've been you've been energized and you're smiling <laughs> right now thinking about all the great stuff you're going to do in this this class with Y Combinator. It's, it's going to awesome. be a, it's, it's going to be a long like it's going to take take a while to get this going, but like you have to start somewhere. And, and the <laughs> good thing I was forgot to mention this, the demo day, the investors that come to YC demo day are not risk averse. They love taking really big risks. And if you look on the companies that get funded, it's certainly not the safest companies that only get funded. It's like the moonshots. And, and, and that's how you can fund mm-hmm. some of the companies that have gone through YC, like, like Regetic Computing, building quantum computers, uh, for example. Like These companies are like, like very big ideas, very far in the future, but they get great funding. So, so we need an ecosystem of people that have money that also want to fund these, these high-risk projects. And um, it's not... That, that's just how, how, how this have to work. And YC is so fortunate to have those people come and, and fund the companies after Demo Day. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's the same. It's the same thing. Like, it's it's this escalating cycle of behavior more so than it's what has been, I think, promoted in the past, which is very yeah. uh, competitive ecosystem. It's just, it's it's this, the idea that Y Combinator sticks to, which is, well, if we then, if we learn a bunch of things and then we just teach everybody those things, then it will just increase the quality of people that come through this program and continue to do stuff. And then also we happen to make money off of it because that's, yeah, you gotta, <laughs> but over here, you know. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for coming on. And thank you to our listeners for thank checking you out so much. another episode. Uh, if you want to listen to more, just follow us wherever you get your podcasts. We recommend Breaker. I recommend Breaker. A awesome. Y Combinator company. <laughs> <laughs> And thanks again to Leah for putting us in touch. But uh, this is his Engineering Podcast. I'm Adam. Brian. I'm Gustav. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming on, Gustav. Have a great day, everybody. Yeah.